Welcome, Motenta people. Errol Flynn, a rebellious child who maintained his bad boy image as a Hollywood star, was much more than he was known for. He was fascinated with the depths of the sea, but no one could find out that he himself was hiding some deep secrets. Why is Errol Flynn remembered for all the wrong reasons? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Motentis channel. Errol Flynn, Hollywood's Bad Boy Known more for his bad boy attitude off-screen, Errol Flynn is the name that immediately comes to mind when one considers the renowned actors of the golden age of Hollywood. His classy swashbuckler persona on screen inspired viewers and warmed hearts. Off screen, he had relationships with several different women, partied heavily, and was open about it. His autobiography title, My Wicked Wicked Ways, was a jab at his lawless way of living. Errol Flynn's main story was that he had it all good looks, charm, talent, intelligence, a substantial fan base of devoted admirers, and willing women. He epitomized the concept of a romantic lover and swashbuckling hero. In a way that excelled any movie he had ever made, Flynn lived the life that most men could only dream of. However, he started living a dangerous lifestyle that destroyed his career and led to his death somewhere along the line of becoming a movie legend. Why did it happen? What forces were at play in this complicated person? All of Flynn's little secrets were revealed after his untimely death, providing a truly jaw-dropping conclusion to a life marked by tragedy and controversy. Keep watching this video till the end and know all those secrets. Theodore Thompson Flynn, an Australian lecturer, and Lily Mary Young welcomed Errol Leslie Thompson Flynn into the world on June 20, 1909, in Battery Point, Tasmania. Because of his parents' love of sailing, Flynn became fascinated by the ocean. Flynn, who went to school in Hobart, has always been interested in acting. At Southwest London College in London, England, he continued his education before going back to Australia to enroll in Sydney Church of England Grammar School. After being dismissed from his junior clerk job and expelled from school, he spent the following several years working odd jobs while traveling between Papua New Guinea and Sydney. Flynn exhibited in his early years both the fiery temperament and sensual charisma that would later make him popular with both moviegoers and Hollywood paparazzi. He was dismissed from school for fighting and once having an affair with the school laundress's daughter. He had already attempted his luck at copper mining, operating a tobacco plantation, and prospecting for gold before he stumbled into acting in 1933, appearing in the Australian movie In the Wake of the Bounty. He was bursting with restless energy and maintained that energy throughout his journey. After that, Flynn migrated to Britain and joined a repertory company, but he stayed there for six months before Hollywood scouts noticed him and offered him a deal with Warner Brothers. He traveled around the world, and even though his early roles were utterly forgettable, the studio was anxious to turn him into a celebrity. Flynn, however, had other plans. It was a woman he had met while traveling to the U.S. via ship who had mockingly rejected him. Flynn approached her because he loved a challenge more than anything else. Demita was gorgeous, French, and five years older than him. She was a must for him. Within a few weeks, they made their big announcement. They were flying to Arizona right away to get married. After that, they relocated to the Hollywood Hills. But behind the surface, their perfect union was a horror show. Demita gave up acting when they got married. Fortunately for Flynn, this only meant that he could benefit from her connections and fame. He made his acting debut in Captain Blood in 1935, starring opposite a young Olivia de Havilland. Audiences were left in awe of their on-screen chemistry, and soon rumors about the couple began to emerge. After all, Lily Demita Flynn's wife didn't seem to mind. That wasn't an issue for her, but another type of jealousy was. Demita was enraged that Flynn was the more well-known person in the couple now, and she didn't hold back in unleashing her rage at him. Demita's jealousy for her attractive spouse reached such an all-time high that Flynn had to quit. He finally lost his temper on the set of his subsequent movie, The Charge of the Light Brigade, but he saved the worst for studio head Jack Warner. His outbursts were filled with anti-black slurs and cries for more money. These outbursts were undoubtedly fueled by genuine animosity, but Flynn was also upset with his wife. Despite having different homes, they still spent their time fighting. 
Furthermore, Demita was never slow to remind Flynn during arguments that she would expect sizable alimony if he attempted to get a divorce. He was trapped, and things could only get worse from here. But what about Flynn's career during that chaos? Well, likely his career was only blooming during that period. Flynn would play his most well-known role, Robin Hood, after landing more prominent roles in movies including Greenlight, Another Dawn, and The Prince and the Pauper. The movie, which also featured another Flynn de Havilland pairing, was the studio's first major production to use the three-strip Technicolor technique. Despite the fact that the adventures of Robin Hood made Flynn famous, it restricted the kind of roles the studio would give him. Since Flynn was a popular swashbuckling figure, viewers anticipated seeing him in roles that fit the genre. Dodge City proved to be a Western movie and another well-attended 1939 release after previous box office failures in other roles and genres. Flynn would go on to appear in more Westerns, dramas, comedies, romances, and adventure movies. Flynn would play one of his favorite roles as boxer Gentleman Jim Corbett in Gentleman Jim the next year. In order to prepare for the part, Flynn trained in boxing. Additionally, he would sign a new deal with a studio, agreeing to feature in four films annually, one of which would be produced by Thompson Productions. He was getting more and more successful. So how can we expect any improvement in his relationship with his jealous wife? If having a child had been Demita's last-ditch effort to keep the marriage intact, it flopped. Finally, the couple divorced in 1942, after spending seven years apart rather than together. Despite being a master philanderer, Flynn had a difficult time accepting loss. He constructed an eight-acre ranch-style colonial residence on Mulholland Drive, which at the time was thought to be remote in the Hollywood Hills, as his retreat and party hub in the 1940s. It was there that he entertained leading ladies like Anne Sheridan, Linda Christian, Hedy Lamar, and Ida Lupino. It was built with hidden passageways, two-way mirrors, and peepholes. Flynn's alcohol addiction seemed to be unstoppable along with other bad habits. Wondering about outcomes? He was diagnosed with tuberculosis, but the worst was yet to come. The expression, in like Flynn, has come to be associated with Errol Flynn because of how legendary his relationships were. And it makes total sense. Flynn was a well-known womanizer who encountered little to no resistance in the pursuit of women, and the expression first appeared not long after Flynn rose to fame. Therefore, Flynn must bear personal liability for it, right? However, etymology is an imperfect science, and the origin of some words and phrases don't necessarily correspond to what popular culture asserts about them. According to Gustavo Bruckner of Worldwide Words, the expression has nothing to do with the actor. He claims that it could have instead been referring to New York Democratic campaign manager Edward J. Boss Flynn, whose candidates were so easily elected that they were in a context in like Flynn. For his part, Errol Flynn seems to enjoy being linked to the expression. In fact, according to New World Encyclopedia, the publisher persuaded the actor to use the more appropriate title, My Wicked Wicked Ways, for his autobiography, instead of the phrase's intended meaning, In Like Me. While new people kept on entering and leaving Flynn's life, one creature was permanent. That was Flynn's pet dog, Arno, who never left his side. The actor took the dog to events like movie premieres and dinners. In fact, the tiny mutt, as his owner referred to him, even slept in the same bed as his owner. In 1943, Errol Flynn wed Nora Eddington in Acapulco, Mexico. But he wasn't happy after that. Following the ceremony, Flynn left for New York City, leaving Eddington pregnant and alone in Mexico. He arrived soon before she gave birth after an absence of six months. By the time his daughter Deirdre was born, he had already left the building because he couldn't face even being in the same room as the birth. Nora Eddington was the one who could truly understand what it was like to be married to Errol Flynn. But as he was out there with extras and women he met in clubs, she was hiding a scandalous secret of her own. Richard Hames was a singer who sparked Eddington's eye. Although he and she both had spouses, they decided to leave them for one another. The independence was wonderful, but as we all know, Flynn never dealt well with rejection. Flynn immersed himself into his work, the drink, and a new engagement to comfort his bruised ego. This time, it was Patrice Wymore, a 21-year-old ingenue who was his most recent co-star. His personal life finally appeared to be getting better but not his professional life. After the war, Flynn made appearances in a few fairly popular movies, but he had lost some of his peaks. He battled alcoholism and drank excessively while filming, which impacted his image. He spent many years working for Warner Brothers before being loaned to MGM to act in that Foresight Woman and Kim. 
Before his 18-year partnership with Warner Brothers came to an end, Flynn would make an appearance in another Warner swashbuckler, the master of Bellantrae. His reckless way of living caught up with him by the 1950s. He once said, I have a zest for living, but equally the urge to die. Directors could not rely on him to be at the set on time or remember his lines because of his drug and alcohol addictions, which had left his once attractive face bloated. Flynn continued to appear in and create movies after moving to Europe. He actively sought work to pay off his debts after the unsuccessfully 1954 production of The Story of William Tell drained his finances. He presented and performed in his television series, The Errol Flynn Theater. In 1957, he received a role in Istanbul from Hollywood once more. After landing a part in the popular movie The Sun Also Rises that same year, Flynn went on to play a drunk in a number of roles. He had minor film appearances during the 1950s, but it wasn't enough to support his way of life, especially because by that point, he was essentially separated from Wymore and once again on the hunt. Unfortunately, he would eventually reach a dark place as a result of his persistent financial issues. A brief Hollywood comeback was insufficient to fend off the IRS and bill collectors for very long. In order to avoid losing it to the tax authorities, he made the decision to move his boat, the Zaka, up to Vancouver. And it wasn't the only thing he was bidding farewell to. Flynn was sure to spend time with his daughters and ex-wife Nora before departing on the trip because he was aware that his condition was worse than ever. They wouldn't see him again after that. Flynn requested while visiting a couple in Vancouver that he see a doctor complaining of pain. The doctor advised Flynn to rest, gave him some prescription and a leg massage. But when he checked on Flynn again, the doctor discovered something truly awful. He was unresponsive, and it was already too late when he was transported to the hospital. His liver was such in bad shape from years of drinking and addiction that cirrhosis would have developed within a year, even if the heart attack hadn't claimed his life. On October 14, 1959, Flynn, who was 50 years old, passed away. He was laid to rest at Forest Lawn, Glendale. High-flying adventure, crazy parties, and scandal dominated Errol Flynn's life, though some of the worst scandals only emerged after his passing. Errol Flynn, The Untold Story, written by Charles Hyam, was published in 1980 and featured a number of alarming allegations. The most prominent one was the assertion that Flynn had served as a German spy during World War II. Charles Hyman's main justifications were Dr. H. F. and Freddie McAvoy, two of Flynn's close friends who were thought to be anti-Semitic German sympathizers. While the claims about Flynn's friends were valid, Hyman also asserted that someone confessed to him that her husband, who worked closely with Errol Flynn, had overheard him disclose he was confidentially working for the Germans. However, the 1990 book Errol Flynn, The Spy Who Never Was, eventually invalidated the theories that were posthumously believed. Over the course of his three marriages, Errol Flynn had a total of four kids. Although in the years leading up to his passing in 1959, Errol spent most of his time with his final lover and only companion, Beverly Adlin, whom he had first met when she was just 15 years old. He had a tiny bit of self-awareness and was proud of his cinematic career more than anything else. He writes, Maybe I haven't been such a loss after all. In a world that is otherwise filled with dread and often very gloomy, Anyone who can contribute a few moments of happiness to another person's life certainly cannot be wasting his time. Maybe it wasn't all that pointless after all. Perhaps it wasn't all wasted. Do you think that these words of Flynn are very deep and meaningful? After all, he spread smiles on the faces of his viewers and gave a lot to the film industry despite whatever he was doing in his personal life. Whether he was a German spy or not, he was a wonderful actor who mesmerized his viewers with his fascinating on-screen persona. So shouldn't we celebrate him for what he gave to us rather than what he did to himself? Share your thoughts in the comments section below. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Perhaps Errol Flynn himself knew that you can't live like that for long. Did other stars know that they were going to die? Richie Valens predicted his own death? Let's find out the details from this video.